Hello there, my host Dan Rojas. In this video, we are going to be making a Fresnel lens stand that you have seen the power of in previous videos. The neat thing about this stand, it's going to cost you around 20 bucks to build. If you add in the power mechanisms, the drill motors that we added to it, you're looking at around 50 to 60 bucks if you have to buy them. If you can use scrap drills that the batteries are dead on, then it's free pretty much. You need some all threads for it. I'm going to be covering the entire process for this. The nice thing about this stand is that there are many different ways to control it. We are using a helio track for it, which determines where the sun is. And once you have it set, it will track the sun throughout the day. It accommodates for clouds, a little bit more expensive. You can do the manual controls where you take the leads from the battery, touch it to the motor and slowly advance it, or you could make a joystick control. To do this project, you are going to need some woodworking skills and tools. We're going to be starting with the braces. In my opinion, the braces are the most important part of a lot of projects because they give it stability. You don't want the legs on this flopping around. In the summertime, the stand will be laying pretty much flat in most parts of the year and it's going to be using it. If you're up around Canada or more northern climates, it's going to have to tilt upward. So you don't want your legs buckling. In the wintertime, pretty much wherever you are, it's going to need to tilt up to track the sun. The reason that we do the legs lifting up versus having the whole arm structure move, it makes it a lot simpler, a lot more stable, and it works really, really good. It's always important to start with nice straight two by fours when you pick them out at the wood place, Lowe's, Home Depot, lay them on the floor and make sure. These are all nice and straight. I'm looking for one that maybe is not so perfect because the braces don't have to come from a perfect piece of wood because they're shorter. This one's got just a slight curve up here, so this will be perfect. You're going to need two two by fours for this first part. I'm going to be using a stop guard rail that I made. It's just a piece of 2 by 4 Here's a close-up of it. This just sits on there and slides back and forth. It allows me to get an exact area on our wood cut. We just simply take a wood screw. Once we're set, we screw it into position and the rest of our cuts we don't have to measure. You want to cut these braces at 12 inches. It's a good idea to periodically check your chop saw to make sure that the angles are right with a angle that is perfectly set. We're setting this at 45. I've tested the saw. I test my saw about every week or two and it's right on. The first cut that we're going to do is just to take the ends off. You always want to wear eye protection and the proper protective gear when you're working. Also keep your hands outside the little black lined area. Once we have it cut, we flip it, turn it. Put our second cut in. We now have a brace that is 45 degree angles on both sides, which comes out to a nice 90 degree corner. You don't need to cut a cutoff piece for this. All you do is flip and turn your wood. Push it against the stop guy. These two are the same size. These don't have to be absolutely perfect if you're using scrap wood in terms of their length, but it makes your project look a lot better. You also want to make sure that the 45s are true 45s because it will make a big difference with the quality of your project. I'm going to be doing this 10 more times so we get 12 of them. These are the two lenses that I have the choice of working with. There's Big Daddy and uh, Smaller Daddy. That one I'm going to save for a build without video because it's so big, it's going to require a lot of work to do. This one is more like your standard lens, a little bit bigger than what you'll probably get a hold of, but the height on this lens frame is 51 and a half inches. The width on it, 36 inches. Normally we frame the lenses to the width put it on the stand. These stands are tricky to move around. They work great. I've used them for years. The other setup's a lot easier. We don't want the length of the lens going across this way. So we're going to mount it on the top of the lens. That way the skinnier portion of the lens tracks across our stand. If you're using a spot lens, the direction of the lens won't really matter. If you are using a linear lens, you want to make sure that the beam of the lens is lined up for your project. The previous stand that I built was a little smaller, but the length of it is 56 inches. If you're using a lens in the 43 by 31 dimension area, 
56 inches is a good width. We're gonna be doing closer to 64 with this one because it's a bigger lead. We're gonna start with the long rails. They need to be 64 inches long for this. You're gonna start with a 45 degree miter cut. The wood is up this time. It's not laying too flat. Go as far as you can to the edge. And get your first cut, then flip and turn the wood. A lot of people are afraid of miter cuts and they like to do bunt joints, which really, they're not that good. They're not sturdy. This gives you the exact length that you need. If you do it right, it's very easy to put together. We're going to measure point to point. You want to mark it, but I don't have a pen, so I'll be right back. You want to cut right to the very end of your mark. So you want your chop saw to come down right at that point. When working with wood that is long and tall like this, don't lift it up before it comes out or it could bind the blade. So this piece that we just did should be 64 inches long. I'm gonna make two of these. We take these two pieces of wood, they line up perfectly. This is a cutoff piece we had left over from the braces. We're going to cut that. This measurement needs to be as precise as possible. Our lens is 51 and a half inches tall. We want to go 51 and three quarters to give just a little bit of space in case the wood swells a little bit. You don't want it too tight because as the motors move, it'll rub against the wood. You don't want it to be too wide because then it's going to be flimsy. Just about a quarter inch larger than the length of your lens. So we're right on track. We're going to make one more of these, so we have two. So we have our long pieces and our two shorter pieces. We've got the length and we've got the width. To join our miters together, you're going to need to drill a pilot hole. This is a 1 8 inch drill bit. We've got our flat side here. Always use glue. This is an outdoor wood glue. It's about three times the cost of regular Elmer's glue, but it will hold very good. Line your first rail up and you join your miter together. It should line up pretty perfectly if you did it right. This one looks good. You want to drill a small pilot hole. And I am using two and a half inch wood screws for this. Because this is a tall project, you want to use two wood screws. If you did everything correctly, you should have a giant L that is sturdy. It's not twisting. It doesn't have gaps there. It's real important. We're going to repeat this process one more time. We have two halves now. Take your L and flip it over and you're going to apply glue to both ends. This will enable glue to get into the final miter. There's a gap there. This piece of wood had a slight twist to it. Since the bottom touches up nicely, we're going to put that wood screw in first. See how that pulled it together? I have a wood clamp on here that's tightened down. I'm going to put it on the higher portion. And by twisting it, I can close that gap. So I'm going to get my pilot hole drilled first. Not all the way through because you don't want to bump into the other one because it'll give you a bad guide to start with. Got the screw started and I'm going to torque it down. Come in tight. Now once the glue settles, that's going to hold. Anytime you build something with a square shape, if you want to make sure that you did everything correctly, you measure corner to corner. So this one, I'm latching it on there, coming across, 82 and a half inches exactly. I'm going to check the second corner, see where we're at. Eighty-two and a half on the nose. So this is square. For a big object like that, that's really good. It's also nice and flat. You should have a gigantic frame like this. 
For the height of this stand, I recommend it between 30 and 33 inches. My table happens to be just short of 31 inches tall, so I'm gonna build it that way. This enables me to add the legs. When you first put the legs on, they're gonna be really flimsy. It's real important that these cuts are nice and square. It's gonna affect your project if they're not. So this piece should be just short of 31 inches. And it is just short of 31 inches. I'm going to make three more of those. These pieces line up perfectly. This is going to make sure that our table is not wobbling. So I'm going to come in with my first 2x4 and line it up under there. I know the cuts are good because it stands up all by itself. These are usually 3.5 inches. You want the length of the 2x4 to go to the shortest section. You can do it like this, but most of the stress is going to be this way when we tilt it for the adjustment. These are 3.5 inches wide. I'm going to mark this, a little eyeballing. This is a 1 half inch paddle bit that I am setting right to the edge, not to the point where it flattens out. And I'm going to be taking a marker and marking my paddle bit at two and a half inches. This lets me know how deep I am when I start this drill. We know the width of our two by four, so we don't want to go beyond it. And we're going to drill two holes, making sure we don't run into the other screws that we put in the corner. These are really just a four position only setup. The reason you need a wider hole is so the head of the screw can go down in there and give you something to work with. This screw would not have the ability to penetrate the wood and grab our leg below. Once we have that part done, we're going to put some glue on the top of the leg. Make sure that there's no sawdust under there and you want to line it up as closely as possible. I'm using my body weight to hold this down. So our first one's in place. That's going to lock this leg down. It's pretty stable. If you look at the seam that we did, it lines up perfect. We check down the lengths of our legs. They line up really good. There's no overlap. They come right to the edge. And our seams are nice and flush with the glue bead in between them. If you did everything correctly, your table should be relatively sturdy. But it's not going to have the ability to handle any torque on it because all the stress is right at the joints. We're going to be adding the braces. There's going to be one that goes in there like this and then one on each leg like this. They're going to get glue and screws. For this I'm using 3 inch wood screws, outdoor usage. You want this to be as flush as possible on the edge. You want to grip it nice and tight in the corner. Give it a good grip and you're going to take and drill a pilot hole matching the angle of your brace. Get your wood screw started. It's going to lock that in. We're going to do the same thing on this side. And since we're using a lot of force, this is a no-no. Because if you slip off of that screw, you can jab the drill right in your eye, knock your teeth out. I mean, you're pretty much going to be done and look really different for the rest of your life. So. You don't want to do that. If you're working with two people, make sure their face is in here either. It's real easy to pop off the screws. I have poked myself before. Not a lot of fun, so be very cautious when you do this. With a fair amount of tension, it goes right in. You want these to be as snug as possible. When it's nice and flush all the way down, what a brace does is it gives you the entire area. So this is like a solid block of wood through here. If they're flushed up, when the glue seals, 
Makes a nice connection. It's never coming apart. Flip it over. And we know that our legs are sturdy. These legs would have just snapped off at this point by just putting pressure like this. So the braces give it tons of structure. Ty built a spiraling table in here. I'm checking the width to make sure that it is the 51 and 3 quarters that we needed. So it's just a touch larger than our Fresnel lens. Everything looks good. You can put a tabletop on this and have one heck of a table. So it can tilt this way with weight on it and it's not going to go anywhere because those braces are there. So we could in theory, not that you'd want to, but tilt everything all the way up this way. I'm going to be measuring my project. It is 64 inches long. Half of 64 is 5 inches. Hopefully you were paying attention there. Half of 64 is actually 32 inches. You want to make sure that you really, really pay attention on this part because if you drill these holes incorrectly, you're going to have holes drilled all over. You may even compromise the integrity of this wood and you're going to have to start over because everything's together. So pay very close attention. 64 inches, half of that's 32. We're going to mark that out. It's a good idea to go all the way to the edge and definitely measure from the same side just in case your project happens to be not squared. Say you don't do as good of a job as I did. I'm not bragging, but it's pretty damn close. So we go right at 32 over here, and you want to, I'm marking it on both sides. This is one inch steel pipe. It's extra pipe that I had left over from a Max Air fan that I bought. You can use regular one inch steel pipe that you buy at Lowe's or Home Depot. You want to cut these to be 10 inches long. I used a abrasive chop saw blade for it. You can use a pipe cutting tool. Some of the stores will actually cut it for you in advance, or you can buy shorter pieces. They come in different lengths. I suggest you make them about 10 inches long. You can go shorter if you want the profile to be a little narrower, but this gives you room to work with should you goof up a little bit. I am using a corded drill for this with a one inch paddle bit. You wanna wear eye protection for this part. So if you have it lined up, you wanna take a square, measure one and a quarter inches down. I'm going to go ahead and draw a line from where it starts and we have our intersection right there so it's one and a quarter from the top you want your drill point to go right in there and get it started make sure that you don't let it twist I'm holding my body firmly against the drill once you have your hole through we're going to do the same thing on the other side and they should line up perfectly. I'm sliding my steel pipe through so that it sticks out about five inches on each side. Place permanently right on that line that you drew across the center. Take a 1 8 inch drill bit. Hold the piece of steel steady. Go through the wood and through the steel pipe. Next take a two and a half or three inch screw, wood screw. I'm gonna lock it into place and give it some strength. In my experience with these stands, I found that going 84 inch length for the arms is the best choice. From the bottom, you wanna come up 27 inches. This is gonna make it top heavy. I put three holes down the side, small holes for the lens to bolt into. The height of these is going to depend on the focal length of your Fresnel lens. If you have a smaller lens with a shorter focal length, you can come lower. You don't need to go as high. It's a good idea to always trim off the first edges of your 2x4. That way you get rid of the tag and the little splits that might be on the end. So we have two 84 inch 2x4s. These should be as straight as possible. That's the sound you want to hear. You want to hear that wood clank together. You don't want them bowing out. By clamping these two pieces of wood together on both sides, I can go ahead and take care of the drill holes that we need with a single shot. We're going to be using our one inch paddle bit again. For this, you want to get a mark at three and a half inches from the bottom. Because the two by fours are not four inches across, they're three and a half, we're going to mark it at one and three quarters. 
which is exactly half. So we're three and a half from the bottom and we are one and three quarters from the side. <laughs> You're gonna get a lot of sawdust with that. We're gonna measure up here to 27 from the bottom. Now this is really important. You have to be perfectly centered here too. And we're through. This is gonna be where our rails rock back and forth. If you look, we went completely through saw blade and cutting two more steel pipes this time they're going to be eight inches long you can do all four of them eight inches that works too i'm just trying something new with this but these are for the weights so they don't need to be extremely long but you do need to be plugged in oh boy We've got two of these, they're going to hold our weights. We're going to do the same process that we did for the stand. At this point, it's okay to remove your clamps. These two can come separate now. Any wood fragments, just go ahead and pull them off. You should have your big holes at 27 inches and your other big holes down at three and a half. If you think you're going to need more weights, you probably want to do these around 10 inches if you have a really big lens, but you want it to stick out two inches on the inside and you want it to stick out about four inches on the outside. This will give you enough room for three weights, like three sets of plates, lock it down. This inner bar actually has a purpose. So we're gonna do the same drilling method that we did before. So those are secured in place. The purpose of those extra pieces of pipe is they lock like this. Without them, your lens could fall and hit the ground should something happen. So now it's time to get this bad boy out of here. So this next part is best to have two people because you need to put the weights on simultaneously. These are 25 pound steel workout plates. Two of them together are gonna weigh 50 pounds. Even though the lens doesn't weigh 50 pounds, because we are not in perfect center, it's gonna need extra weight on the bottom. So it's got a nice rock to it back and forth. It's a little bit heavy, probably 40 pounds would have been perfect. You want to get this to be as close as possible to the weight that you need. Good shot.
For this next step, you want to take a 7 inch piece of 2x4 that you cut, the spares that we have left over. You want to measure down 3 inches and draw a line around it like that. You also want to measure this way 2.5 inches. There's a reason why we're using a slightly larger board. You can go smaller with this. This seems to work the best for me. You find the perfect center, which is one and three quarters, because that's how the two by fours are. And at the two and a half inch area from the side, you want to drill a hole that's a little bit bigger than an eighth of an inch in diameter. You want this hole to be as straight as possible, because this is going to be mounting to the side frame. You want to pick which side you want to face your drive motor. We're going to designate this the side that gets our thread to go through. On the back side, I'm going to find the perfect center on this. So this one is one and a half, so the perfect center would be three quarters of an inch. So we're at three quarters here. I'm going to flip it over and we've got our three quarters marked right here. So this should go perfectly through. I don't recommend using a corded drill for this part because it's kind of a uh, uh, it's kind of a tricky process, and you can twist your wrist loose. You can you don't have a lot of wood to grab onto. There's a reason why we want a bigger hole in the back side. So you want to take your three quarter inch paddle bit. And you want to drill down an inch and a half. So we're going to measure that to see where we're at right now. So now we come over to the front side here. And this is really important. I'm going to zoom in for this so you can see what's going on. This is where our 3 8 inch bolt goes. A 9 16 inch paddle bit fits that almost perfectly. You don't want to go all the way deep with this. All you want to do is find the center, get started. And you want to recess it just enough for this bolt to fit in there. Now your bolt has a nice area to sit in. You want to take this off. And you're going to pick up the same hole all the way down with the 3 8 inch. What this is going to do is give you an area for this nut to rest on. And we should blow right out the back there. On the back side of this we have a large three-quarter inch hole. On the front side we have a nine sixteenths or you can do five eighths inch hole that this nut is going to fit snugly in. There's a three eighths inch hole that goes down the center that are all threads going to slide down. The reason that we don't go all the way through is we need something to rest against this. You can mount this above the wood, but it's better if it's recessed in. So once we have everything lined up, we're going to hammer this into place. Pinch it in just like that. Believe it or not, this works really good. To the outside. You don't want to go into the path of the all thread. So the screw should not overlap and you don't want to get debris down in there. So I'm doing the reverse drill method to just clear out. You also want to make sure you don't split the wood at this point because that would be kind of sucky. So your all thread should go through there pretty easily. We're going to test it out. And it's, it goes on there nicely. So this fits in there. The reason you want to do the backside larger is as the angle changes, you're going to bump into the outer portion of this. This 3 8 inch piece of all thread is 36 inches long. If you can find a 4 foot piece, that would be even better. The higher up you go here with this, the less torque it's going to put on your drill motor. I'm going to be going at 18 inches from center, which is going to put us right on a knot. So instead of working with the knot having to worry about splitting it, I'm going to go ahead and bring this down to 17 and a half inches. You want to find and mark the true center on your piece of wood. 
we're going to take a three inch wood screw. You can use a bolt if you want to get a little more intricate, but we're just going to grab the wood. So we want to go ahead and tighten it to where it doesn't move. It digs a little bit of a recess and then back it out because the further that screw is in, the better. You can add like a bearing there. That's the better way to do it. This is fast and simple. I'm gonna spray some oil on there just to make sure nothing happened. So we're at the point where we can test this with a regular drill. We wanna make sure you grab the threads nice and tight. Now you wanna simulate where you would be. I want you to notice what happens to the drill as I move this. See how the drill starts to angle upward? For the drive mechanism, we're going to be using a cordless drill. This is a 3 8 inch drill, new from Harbor Freight. They cost like $17. It comes with the battery and the charger. It's an 18 volt setup. The 3 8 inch chuck will work perfectly for our 3 8 inch all thread. You can use drills that you have laying around. Once the batteries go bad, people usually just ditch the drill. So you can find drills that are used for almost nothing on the internet. We're going to be taking this apart because this drill has a reversible switch in it. The switch prevents you from just simply attaching leads to here and reversing the voltage. Our helio track. When it detects the sun, it adjusts, so if it moves too much this way, it goes back the other way. It needs to go one direction and the other. If you just hook directly to here, you're only going to be able to go in one direction. That's going to be determined by the switch. The Harbor Freight drills are very easily hackable. They have a Phillips screw that is easy to remove. If you're just doing a regular manual drive system, you could probably just hook the drill up and reverse it. We're also going to be using door hinges. The reason for that when I showed you how it works with the drill, the angle changes. So if we were to just stay in one position, locked down, what would happen is the bar would start to bend as our Fresnel lens comes up and the angle changes. So you need something that allows the motor to move up and down on a swivel basis. Since this video is loaded with information, we're going to be doing a single axis on this. We're just going to be doing one drill motor. Future video, I'm going to be showing you how to get the second axis so you can track it exactly throughout the day, make your annual adjustments manually. To take this drill apart, we're going to be using a Phillips bit with this drill, extendable bit, and the screws just come right out. should just peel right off and you have your controller unit here with the switch some drills the motor actually will fall out of the planetary gear Harbor Freight drills are one solid piece so we can just chuck right down to our all thread and that keeps us perfectly centered takes a lot of the machining out of the process you're gonna have a white wire and a black wire you want to get a pair of scissors cut these and strip it down I like to split the difference with the wire that way you can use your switch controller for something else. If you cut it all the way down here, you won't have that option. So this is a nice little variable speed controller that you can use for other projects. And they hook right into the battery. So you've got, you still have the LED light. So I've stripped the wires. The battery we're gonna use as the power unit for this. The charger that comes with this, you can charge it with grid power. These are only running for less than a minute a day. So the battery will run for probably three days on one full charge cycle. Not necessary to hook a solar panel up to it, but if you do, you can get away with a very small solar panel that's designed for keeping your battery refreshed, something in the six watt range. It's not gonna pull much throughout the day. Small panel like that will easily keep this up. The hinge is going to be attached with a plastic strap 
and that's going to hold it in place. We need a small piece of wood to be attached to our stand that's in a straight line with the arm that supports the Fresnel lens. You want to make sure that you can cover the entire path of the sun early morning to late afternoon and we're going to be putting our mount right here. The size of your Fresnel lens and the size of your stand is going to determine where you put the back of the mount. The back of the mount is where the motor can sit and swivel. If you put it on the upper part centered, it's not going to have the ability to lift up because it's going to hit the wood that it sits on. I'm going to be doing this 64 inch length stand at 10 inches. You don't want to get too close to your arm over here because it could actually bump into it. This will give me a place to attach my platform. You want to clear off any wood. You definitely want a secured attachment. So we're going to be gluing and screwing this. If you want, you can go a little bit shorter, but I suggest an eight inch piece. So that's locked down in place. Now, if you want, you can take your scrap angles from anything left over and attach it there. That's going to give it a little more support. I'm going to put one. We don't really need one in the front. So that's drawn down nice and tight. Our hinge is going to set opening like this. This enables us to go down and come up. You don't want to put it this way because you'll be too high. You don't want to put it all the way up on there because then it's going to lock up when the drill motor hits the back of this. So you want the drill motor to hang over so that it can sit like this and go all the way up or all the way down. I'm going to put these in place with small one and a quarter inch wood screws. If we were to put our hinge all the way flushed over, you're going to run into a problem because the motor is going to be centered on here when we put the straps. The rod doesn't flush up that way, so we have to go over just a little bit, and this is going to put us right where we need to be. So we now have a hinge attached. I'm going to be using a wide strap to lock the motor in place. This strap will not fit through these holes. So we're going to be taking our drill bit, and we're going to be boring it out. You do this after. Now this strap should fit through here pretty easy, and it does. You want the head of the strap to be on the outside. You don't want it to be in here because it can get crushed when it goes down. We have our Harbor Freight motor attached. This is going to give us the ability to go up and down. Put the drill all the way over on the no slip setting. We've got it in place. You want this ridge to grab because this is where it's going to be pulling. So that's locked on there good, but it still has a little wobble to it. I'm using smaller straps that fit through there. One strap won't fit around, so we have to double them up. I'm looping one through the other, and we want these on the top. So we start with one, lock it in so that it's on the top. You want to loop it through, and your second one goes there. That way none of the knots are in the place they don't need to be. And now our motor has stability, still has a little wobble, but most of the force is going to come this way and this way. So we've accommodated for both. You can put a secondary strap on there if you want. This seems to work really good. There's better ways of mounting it. You can do a bracket, probably the best way. This is a quick way. The next part is going to require a little bit of muscle. You want this to go all the way in and be firmly pressed. You don't want it to be part way out. You're grabbing the threads, so we have it locked down. This will slip out pretty easily with smaller chuck. Half inch drill would be perfect for this, but this one's right at the edge. The bigger the drill head, the better the lock's going to be. That's in there pretty good. I have the battery. This is a charged one. I'm using the battery mechanism. I cut and strip the wires. I'm going to make sure they don't touch together. That lock's in there. And if we want to reverse it, 
just for manual use. So in this video, we made a solar tracker with a Fresnel lens on one axis that can track the sun throughout the day with manual adjustment. In a future video, I am going to be adding the Helio Track, which tracks the sunlight, tells the motors what to do. We're going to be adding the second axis instead of the wheel version like I had in the previous video, the prototype. We're going to be making a scissor lift that goes up. If you have linear actuators from old satellite dishes, they will work for this. Buying new ones, they cost anywhere from $75 to $105 and upwards. You need one with about a 24 inch draw, so they get kind of expensive. The all thread, the drill motor, and the nut that we made is a much better option in terms of price, and it works. I've used it for several weeks now. Very stable, doesn't fall apart, holds up really good. I also showed you how to hack a Harbor Freight drill, which is very simple. In a previous video, links below, I showed you how to hack more complex drills and use them. It takes the switch assembly out of the process, which allows you to reverse the polarity of the voltage, getting the motor to go the opposite direction without freaking the switch out. People have asked me about arraying two Fresnel lenses together. If you have two Fresnel lenses that have center spots on them, meaning they're not half lenses, they're whole lenses that go outward, you cannot array two of them together without the additions of mirrors. They will have two complete focal points no matter how you put them over. Layering Fresnel lenses on top of one another does not increase the power. Fresnel lenses, parabolic mirrors, curved glass, they all do the same thing. They concentrate sunlight, they do not amplify it. So adding multiple lenses, one on top of the other, simply shortens the focal length and it does tighten the spot a little bit, but the light filtering that you get takes away from your power. In the previous video, I showed you how adding a secondary lens to a Fresnel lens short of the focal point, while it does tighten the spot a little bit, you lose too much power with the light filtering. Adding a parabolic mirror to catch the light and bounce it up won't work either because it'll damage an acrylic parabolic mirror and it'll also mess up a metal mirror. The heat pattern is just too much for it. You're better off going with the Fresnel lens all by itself. There is an option to adding a parabolic mirror with very long focal length off axis to your target. This will increase the overall power because the mirror is redirecting sunlight. It is not simply taking what the Fresnel lens has and concentrating it down more. It's adding completely separate additional sunlight to your target. We'll be covering that in a future video too. This is the first step in the process of creating the solar tracker that I named after myself. I'm your host, Dan Rojas. Thank you for watching and enjoy our videos. Mm -hmm.